Hello, ICAPs. My name is Pete Troutman, and I'll be presenting real-time crowd navigation from First Principles of Probability Theory. My co-author is Karen Kumar Patel, and we're both at the Honda Research Institute in San Jose, California. For a little background, I want to explain what I mean by crowd navigation. So first of all, uh, we're going to be considering, considering unstructured crowds where there's no flow rules or static obstacles. And we're also only going to collect time-stamped XY data, so trajectories. So uh, one of the core problems in crowd navigation is something called the freezing robot problem. And this happens when we don't account for how the robot's actions influence the people around it. And so as we see in these pictures, if the robot looks forward and sees a crowd coming at it that are very densely packed, it can very well decide that there isn't a, a, a safe path through that crowd. Whereas humans, very very naturally and very instinctually leverage the cooperation of other agents. And so what this leads to is what we call the freezing robot problem, where the robot will take extremely evasive maneuvers or just freeze in place. So there's also a different, a different aspect to this freezing robot problem. The freezing robot problem is something that happens at high crowd densities that we know for sure. <clears throat> but we can also see from empirical data that um, decoupling leads to suboptimalities at any density. So here we have two models that we're comparing. Uh, the magenta one is a, is a model that doesn't capture interaction and the blue model is one that does. And what we see is a large safety decrement in all densities, just simply from dropping the interaction term. So what that leads us to is the necessity of coupled models. And you might couple your model or, couple or, or, or model interaction in a number of different ways. For us, we're going to consider joint probability distributions. In this case, we're labeling it P of H and FR, where H is the human and FR is the robot, and H can expand and contract as more people enter or leave the scene. And then we look at the joint arg max of that distribution, and then we take the next step in the control cycle to be uh, the next step in the robot's arg max trajectory. I also want to point out, this is important for this paper, that we're going to choose a particular factorization of this joint distribution in which we have two individual agent models. So the robot agent model, FR, P of FR, and the human agent model, P of H. <clears throat> and those models don't capture any interaction. They're just how the, how the agents would move um, if they were completely alone. And then we have an interaction function, psi, <clears throat> with parameters gamma. And our core question in this paper is what must psi model if we want to avoid freezing robot problems? And how can psi model it? And in particular, the question how is about what are, what are the, the permissible parameters, statistically speaking? So if we look at, if we look at, if we think about our agent models, P of FI, so here um, that could be P of H or P of F superscript R, we're going to model those as mixtures of Gaussian processes. So the mean of a Gaussian process, we're going to call the intent. And uh, the, the covariance we're going to call the flexibility. And the idea is, is that the flexibility controls how much an individual agent is willing to move off of its desired intent being the mean. And so given those agent models, we have the following theorem. Crowd navigation cost is statistically valid if and only if the cost is only a function of the full set of mixture statistics. So effectively what this says is that the parameter gamma in the interaction function psi um, has to be the full set of mixture statistics if we want it to be statistically valid. And so in this paper, what we've done is we provided a statistically valid interaction function, which we call PIGP for interacting Gaussian processes. Um, although the form of this could be arguably different, we don't have any constraints on the form, just the, the kinds of parameters that are allowed. And we've also provided a real-time locally optimal solver. A corollary to this theorem is that mismodeling flexibility leads to over-aggressive or possibly over-cautious behavior. And we'll see that in a minute in our empirical runs, <clears throat> what over-aggression or over-cautiousness looks like. But essentially, this can be understood intuitively by saying that mismodeling flexibility uh, can, can cause you to be overly forceful or think that the person's not going to move out of your way. So now, given that we have an algorithm in a way to evaluate it, we need to, in, in a way to, in a way to define the, the optima, or the local optima, we need to evaluate these. Now there's some serious challenges in crowd navigation evaluation. 
The gold standard would be, of course, a real world deployment, but this is very expensive. So it can take somewhere between six months and a year to deploy a statistically valid study. In my own thesis research in 2012, it took me about a year and a half to collect enough statistics to make meaningful, to draw meaningful conclusions. Um, and simulation simulators, the state-of-the-art simulators, for instance, work in social forces, are essentially non-discriminative in the sense that the optimal policy is blind straight line movement, right? So the, the, the optimal policy is just to go in a straight line and not slow down for everybody, for anybody. And we can see this here in our chart. So in the table, we have the number of collisions and further to the right is higher density. And SSP2 is what we're calling our blind planner. And you see there's zero collisions, even high densities. And also um, SSP2, because it's just going in a straight line without slowing down, um, gets there as fast as possible. And so that's, you can see SSP2 down here. And so really it's hard to tell how should we test. And social forces has similar results to this. Um, so what we're left with and, and, and what we, what, how we chose to test our algorithm is a so-called leave one out approach. And so what we do is we take a CAN data set, in this case ETH, where we have pedestrian trajectories, and we, ch we choose one particular human, we find their start and their goal, we remove them, and we give the start and the goal to the robot, and then we let the robot run from the start to the goal, and we compare the safety and the efficiency of the robot against the human. And so here's the results of running that on 180 uh, different pedestrians, sort of cycling through that, that data set that I just showed. And I wanna highlight first uh, the, the, safety, the safety path length trade-off that humans make, and that's in red, right? So the first thing to notice is that they trade off those two things very nicely, but I think even more importantly, the covariance ellipse is very tight compared to any of the planners. And so this is something that I think we might use as a sort of upper upper bound on benchmarking and crowd navigation if we want to run these kind of leave one out tests. We also see that uh, the IGP variants, um, which are in black and cyan and in green, get somewhat close, but they still have problems, but they're getting closer to the human, the human benchmark. Whereas state-of-the-art reinforcement learning planner in blue here um, turns out to be overly aggressive. So it has shorter path lengths on average, um, but much smaller safety minimums. And other heuristic-based approaches tend to be overcautious, so their path lengths are very long. And we can see that a little bit more clearly if we draw what we call the D-min line. So D-min, 0.21 meters, is the closest we, uh, we observed in the ETH data set for two people to come to each other. <clears throat> and so we've drawn that line and, draw all the, and drawn all the instances uh, on to the left of that line of all the planners. And so I've I purposely enlarged the IGP uh, upside down triangles to show where there's collisions with IGP. Um, that doesn't mean there's more, there's more of them. There's actually quite a, quite, quite a bit fewer than them than the reinforcement learning algorithms or the other heuristic space algorithms. But it gives you some idea of how many, how many times this occurs. We also can further segment the data in a way that makes it a little bit more discernible and we can understand what's going on if we normalize all the path lengths by the corresponding human path length. So take a, a, a robot path length and divide by the actual path length that the human going from that starting position to that goal position took. And if we do that, we see that the, the IGP variants cluster around uh, the, the DR equal to DH line. So they're pretty close in numbers, uh, whereas the reinforcement learning algorithm is quite a bit lower. So it's it, it's much more aggressive. And, and again, as you can see, <clears throat> we get quite a few more collisions. And conversely, the heuristic space methods um, are, are quite a bit higher than dr equal to dh. So there's, there's, more, there's more charts in the paper in more detail, of course. Um, but the conclusion here is that we provided constraints on permissible interaction functions, um, in particular for GP mixtures and that factorization that we talked about showed that flexibility is a key to mitigating the freezing robot problem, and we provided a discriminative evaluation scenario. Our next steps are to deploy in the real world. Um, there's lots of theoretical avenues that we could deploy, we could explore, but really because the gold standard is deploying in real world environments, that sort of has to be our next step. Thank you.